Hey everyone, welcome to Wrestling with Stereotypes on adfreeshows.com. I'm Kel Dansby. Thank you guys for joining us. It is going to be a great, great show today. We have the head of talent relations from Impact here joining us, D'Lo Brown. You might know him from some other stuff as well. You know, a little here or there. But before we jump into that, I want to toss it to my co-host Andreas Hale to tell you guys a little bit more about wrestling with stereotypes and how we got here. Yeah, thanks, Kel. So first and foremost, I mean, as a, I grew up loving pro wrestling. I grew up with a, an Italian grandmother in New York who used to take me to the garden to watch <laughs> pro wrestling as a little black kid. And I used to watch, and I saw a Junkyard Dog and Kamala, and I saw all these wrestlers who didn't necessarily look like, like me, but were built in stereotypes, and they never won, right? Mm -hmm. And as I got older, I decided, like, as a pro wrestling fan, I felt like we were kind of getting disrespected as fans. Then so a group came along called the Nation of Domination, gave me great pride. My grandmother, who was a little semi-racist, booed the Nation of Domination, and I was like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> so now in my adult age, uh, I've always wanted to talk about the journeys of African-American pro wrestlers, fans, minorities in general, not just African-Americans, because it's a, it's a company, it's a promotion that's built on stereotypes. The early days of pro wrestling was all around stereotypes, but that's not who we all are. So I want to talk about our journeys. We held two panels at StarCast. Uh, some of you may have seen it before. We had some people cry. We had some people laugh. We had some incredible guests. Shout out to Conrad Thompson. He reached out to me and said, hey, do you want to make this a podcast? And I said, absolutely. And now that it's a podcast, who better for a first guest than this man, D'Lo Brown? Kel, can you please introduce this man and where he's from? Man, where he's from? How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, though, you are someone that we look at and reference all the time for your contributions, not just in the WWE, where a lot of people may have seen you, but behind the scenes, your work now in Impact, giving other people opportunities, your work before the WWE. I mean, Dre talks about his Italian grandma. I started watching wrestling because my Puerto Rican grandma <laughs> in New York would take me to shows. And when I went to Puerto Rico every summer, they knew who you were. So you are known everywhere and your contributions are seen throughout pro wrestling. So you're, we're going to go through your entire catalog here. And by the end of this, everyone will know why you're so special to the pro wrestling world. But first, it'd be remiss if we didn't say, what got you into pro wrestling? You heard about Andreas's grandma. You heard about my grandma. What made you a, pre a fan of pro wrestling? Well, first of all, guys, I want to say thank you for having me on the show. Um, it's an absolute pleasure. Uh, I love talking about the struggles of, of men of color in this business and, and, and how we have grown from the times of, like you said, SD Jones and, and Junkyard Dog and, and Rocky King. You know, um, it, it's the, the, the growth of what we've become is amazing. Um, for me, uh, I was a fan since I was nine years old. And unlike both of you, my grandmother hated it. So I had to sneak upstairs on the TV and watch it because she never, if I was sitting downstairs, she'd come back then, you could just pop a kid upside the head. She'd pop him upside the head and go, don't watch that crap. Um, but I just, I just fell in love with it from the time I saw it. Um, I don't know what it was about it. It just drew me in. I remember, I remember sitting on a bed when I was 11 years old, looking at my sister going, I'm going to do that one day with them. And, and just, that was my, didn't matter where I went, college accounting i always had this 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 pull to go be a wrestler and hell here i am still doing it so let's start at the beginning because you started in korea i said i was ace the animal yeah when i first started i was up at the monster factory and you know you don't have an idea what kind of gimmick name you want so my real name is ac and i was ace all through high school and college so my gear had like cheetah print on it so ironically cheetah print um my gear had cheetah print on it, so it was easy ace the animal and it, it, it that that lasted for about a weekend so i want to ask you this because when you first started in this business obviously as we mentioned that uh, you know minorities are viewed in a different light did you have any idea what the gimmick your gimmick was supposed to be or what was it told to you that you should be as a pro wrestler well at first i i was told by larry sharp i should call myself the big cat like Ernie Ladd, because any big black guy who can move around should be like Ernie Ladd. I did not want to be called the big cat. 
So that's what, because he saw my gear, was like, oh, you're the big cat. I was like, no, no, I'm the animal. So I, I didn't want to be in that same pigeonhole of every black guy who's athletic is a pattern of this guy. Or every black guy who's got a good body is patterned after this guy. Um, I always thought from, you know, from day one, I wanted to strike my own path and, and be me. And, and, and not to sound, you know, you know, arrogant or anything. I, just, I never wanted to be anybody else. I just wanted to be me. How hard did you find that, you know, with telling people, I want to be myself? Did you go through any pushback? Were there times where people said, yeah, you can't be you? We yeah. want you to be this. You know, there were times when, you know, there's kind of like, well, I think it's better for you if you did this, or you're an athletic guy who's big, you should do this. And I was like, well, I, I, I agree to disagree. I'll do it if you ask me to, but I don't think that's the best thing for me. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think I should be pigeonholed into A, B, C, or D. Why can't I be X, Y, or Z? You know, so it's like, I never, I, I would, I'd give a little pushback, but at the end of the day, you have to understand that it's give and take and you got to pick your battles you want to die on because at the end of the day, I want to be in the ring and it's, it's it, you got to get to the ring first to perform so people can see who you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, so, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm saying, go ahead. Well, so around 1994, you're in Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Mm -hmm. and you're head of security for a tag team with New Jack and Mustafa, better known as the Gangsters. Yeah. And this was probably maybe your first taste of really dealing with, like, the whole Southern Charm thing and the whole angle because the Gangsters thing was antagonizing crowds and mm -hmm. feeding in the stereotypes in a sense. How did you deal with that, and what was that experience like, especially dealing with New Jack and Mustafa? Okay, so that's one stereotype I didn't mind playing. Because if you go back and look at it, it was, it, was very, it was a very intelligent gimmick because it wasn't about three black guys screaming as loud as they could. It was about three black guys screaming, turning the microphone and turning the spotlight on the people who in the, in the South were inherently racist and showing them for who they were. And that's why they were mad. It's because we were exposing them for who they were. And then New Jack would just tell everybody, OJ took two of them out and... <laughs> made everything okay so but you know growing up in the northeast it that that transition to tennessee was 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 rough uh, i'm not gonna lie because you know i grew up there you know very you know you're in the northeast it, it, there, obviously there's some racism but it's nothing like the south so you go to the south and there are clan rallies you know advertised on tv and you know the N word is, is a normal thing for those people. Confederate flags are, are littered like newspaper. So it, it, it was a very, very different thing. And then, you know, being in the wrestling world, there's getting heat as a heel. And then there's the heel heat where you know they want to kill you. And it's very hard looking out to an audience, which trust me, I enjoy it because that means you're getting over. But it's very hard to look at an audience and look at this person going, man. I'm just wrestling and you think it's real and you want to kill me. All right, it's cool. Let's go. You know? <laughs> when, you, when you have to be around that, right, and you have to perform every night and you're doing this, but word will travel a little bit, but you have to go from town to town, place to place, and mm -hmm. get over every night with this gimmick. Mm -hmm. Was there, you know, just kind of that times where you guys sat, the three of you together, and like, man, we got to up the ante. Because it's, it's just... You know, you could start one place, but it's what happens. How far can we push this quote unquote gimmick? Well, I mean, that was New Jack's job. His new his job was to push the envelope every week on TV to see how far we go before Cornette said, ah, that's a little too much. Fortunately, Cornette never had to say that, you know, because he liked the fact that we were out there generating so much. Because you know what? At the end of the day, wrestling is about putting people in seats. And people paid to see us lose. And when we didn't, they'd come back next week twice as many to see us lose. And so when we're out there doing our thing and we're pushing the envelope and, and we're making white folks mad, all everybody could see was green. <laughs> and, and, and that was the, the amazing thing. And, and that was my first territory. So I got a first look at what, like, a real wrestling territory was like and how it was structured. And, and, and 
how business was done. And man, like Cornette gave me such an education and so as well as the, you know, the guys in the locker room. I mean, like those are the building blocks of what I became. So let me ask you about the relationship with Cornette, because Cornette's gotten a lot of heat over the years about his, you know, his comments on different minorities and races and genders. But you dealt with Cornette. Can you talk about how your relationship was with him and especially going through this time with the gangsters prior to joining the WWE? I'm going to tell you, my time with Cornette was very enjoyable. I understand he's got a lot of people. Cornette's never been anything but um, genuine and, and true to me and what his word was his word. Um, he drove from Louisville to West Palm Beach, Florida for my wedding. So uh, I, I've never had an issue with Cornette. I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to comment on what I think he's doing today's in today's world, you know, world, because I think it's about putting asses in seats, but at the end of the day, um, I've never had an issue with Cornette and, you know, I could call him right now and yell at him, scream at him or laugh with him. Back in those days though, I mean, everyone could have been, as open as Cornette was, right? Like, did you face, uh, you know, going through your journeys before reaching the WWE, before, you know, really establishing yourself as a name, did you face some of these promoters who were, let's just be real, like kind of racist in the background where you went in and you were like, man, this, this is going to be a tough one. Well, yes and no. Fortunately, I was part of a hot act and even a racist promoter will see green and they may not like you, but they're going to put you out there because you're going to draw them money. So yeah, you knew what they were about, but they could, they were never that way openly towards us. Um, the big time I ever faced racism in the beginning was I was in the road to professional wrestling stardom is not paved in gold. Okay. So while I'm in Smoky Mountain wrestling, while I'm wrestling in the main event, most people don't know I'd wait for the, the building to empty, everyone would leave. And then I'd go out and break down the ring. And I would break down the ring and put it on the ring truck. That was my job for six months. The problem with that was the guy who ran the ring truck was a guy named Harold. I won't give his last name. Thankfully, he's not with us anymore. The card carry member of the KKK. So from the time I would get to his place at 11 o'clock in the morning until we took the ring back at midnight, I was called every, every racial epithet on the planet. And every time I complained, Cornette would say, but and justifies me. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But you have to deal with it for a little while just to get where you got to go. And, and I rationalized in my head for about uh, five, six months until I told them, until I had some choice words with them. I couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> so we're going to move ahead. 1997. Uh, you did this brief stint. I think you got squashed by an earthquake once upon a time in your first yeah, yeah, run yeah. in WWE. I was actually AC Corner at the time. As the story goes, Pat, I was in a tag match doing some enhancement work, and Pat Patterson says, your name is AC Corner. And I go, why? He goes, because tonight you're going to stand in the corner. <laughs> so you make your return. That's crazy. So you make a return in 97. Uh, yeah. There's a group called the Nation of Domination Forum. Yes, sir. Uh, if most people remember Shotguns uh, Saturday Night, where you get power bomb by Ahmed Johnson on the car. Yeah. And we all wondered, who the hell is this guy? Because you ended up being the guy that took the bumps for a little while. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about how you got the call, because I've read that you got the call by Cornette that told you to get a suit, get on a plane, show yep. up. Did you have any idea what this angle was going to be that you were going to be involved in? And did you know how far they're going to push it? None whatsoever. All I knew was um, when I got the call from Cornette, and then an hour later I got the call from WWF Travel, only thing I knew was I had to be in New York City at one o'clock on Saturday. That's all I knew. Um, I had you know, no clue what was gonna happen. Um, got there and we started talking through stuff. And you know, the angle was, I, he was just gonna beat me up out there on the outside. And I suggested, why don't you per, do your finish to me on top of the car? And everybody's eyes went, what? And I was like, yeah, just let's go. And by God, that bump, that's the bump that got me a job because when I came back, Mr. McMahon's eyes were about this big. And he goes, I love it. And from that point on, I was, I was, they call me take a bump D'Lo for a long time because if you needed a big bump in the nation, D'Lo was going to make it look good. Before we get right back to talking about the nation and how all that formed, how did you get to D'Lo Brown 
as a name, like instead of AC. And, well, you know, I've read that it has a very special meaning, but how did that yeah. come, come about? So I was, I was wrestling as Ace the Animal, and that just didn't feel right. Um, so I had a friend of mine uh, in high school um, who passed away from cancer, and his nickname was D-Lo. And I was like, God, that's, it was always such a cool name. I was like, that's just a cool name. So I asked his mother if I could use his nickname, and she agreed. And then so, and I said, I'll always pay respect to it, and anytime I'm announced, he's announced. So he gets to live vicariously through me. Um, and Brown just happened to fit. It just rolled off the tongue. And I, I debuted as D'Lo Brown in Smoky Mountain Wrestling. As a matter of fact, my first night in, I was AC Connor in, in the dark match, and I was D'Lo Brown with the Gangsters in the main event. <laughs> I know the crowd was like, wait, I've seen this guy before. Yeah, this guy, he was just here dressed differently with cheetah print, and now he's wearing, like, military stuff. Yeah, literally, that was, that's how it happened. Jesus. So before the Nation of Domination became like the black militant faction, they were really multicultural. Crush was oh, there, yeah, Savio yeah. Vega was there. Yeah. When do you remember it starting to pivot before that, before Farouk fired everybody except for you mm -hmm. and it became this bigger, blacker faction? But prior to that, do you remember the conversations like when is this going to happen when it becomes a black militant faction and we're going to start the gang wars? I, I think it was more of Ron just feeling we needed to get more real and didn't feel that the group had, you know, it had potential, but it needed that edge to it because, you know, other groups had that edge. There was the Heart Foundation. There was DX. They had that edge, you know, and we were just kind of floating over here when we had main event talent, you know, um, and that's when they thinned the herd out and brought in the whole fresh crop of talent. You know, that's when they, they got rid of Savio and, 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 and Crush because we knew we were going to go to the gang wars. And that's when they brought in, you know, uh, Kama and, and Mark. Or was it God for, or was it Rocky? Mark. Too many concussions. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you guys have these moving pieces. You're the constant. When all these things are changing, were you in the background looking around like, man, I, I hope I'm still going to be here. Dude, okay. So you know the expression I had on my face when Ron fired him by in the ring? That's the expression I had in the back when they told me what was going to happen. And I'm like, wait a minute. He's firing him and keeping me? Oh, hell yeah. You know, and, and so you look around, you're like, okay, this guy's going to come in. He's going to overshadow me. But you know what? I'm going to run with him because I'm going to try to be just as, as over as him. Oh, this guy's coming in. Damn it. All right, let me let me work harder. I, and, and it... it it motivated me never to be lost in the shuffle. It motivated me always to steal my moment. When I was, when I was the focal point of anything, I was going to make my presence known. Trick told me by Ron Simmons. Don't ever get pushed to the back. Okay, sir. So all this going on, it was like, man. But it still, it made me work harder and harder and harder because all this talent was starting to come in around me. And I had to step my game up or I'd be lost and they'd find somebody to replace me and that wasn't going to happen. Hmm. So as a black militant faction, you threw up the, the black fist. Um, did it ever, was it ever a little troubling to you that embracing your blackness would get booed? That this was not something that fans necessarily embraced, that they took a lot of pride booing the shit out of the nation of domination? Um, to me, it was just an extension of the gangsters. It was turning the spotlight on them. So by them booing, I embraced it because I was like, you're just booing yourselves. You're showing out to yourselves of who you really are. And that was kind of laughable. You know, and that's what made me motivate. Boo louder. I'm going to do as much to make you boo louder because it's just turn the spotlight on you. And, and, and if, if to be black is bad, I'll be the baddest SOB out there. <laughs> and, I mean, I can only imagine that having someone leading that group like Ron Simmons just oh. gives that, that confidence. You touched on you know, him choosing to keep you. And even to this day, you're just saying like, yes, sir. It, it's just that respect level. Absolutely. How important was it to have him as the, the pin man in that group, have him as the guy in the nation of domination? Well, let's rewind back. It started out me being a fan of Ron Simmons. And in Baltimore, Maryland, when he'd won the world, the WCW World Heavy title, I was sitting in the audience cheering like nobody's business because a man who looked like me was world champion. 
that gave me hope. So to spin it five years later, and I'm standing in a ring next to him live on TV, and I'm looking over, and I'm like, there couldn't be a better person to stand next to. There couldn't be a better role model. There couldn't be a better teacher. There couldn't be a better road buddy. I mean, I got so, so lucky in this business. I could have been put next to anybody. I drew Ron Simmons. Look who's winning. That's what I always say. Look who's winning. I drew Ron Simmons. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, it still strikes you to this day. Uh, are there any memories of you guys being in the city where you had to basically fear for your lives because there was so much heat on the nation at the time? Never, you know, at, at the WWF level, was, wasn't always so, we weren't so close to people because, you know, you're in these big buildings, you leave out the back in your car. It was never, you're walking through a parking lot. Um, so it wasn't like in Smoky Mountain where, hell, you could walk up and people would walk up right next to you and tell you how bad you were. Um, the one time that did scare me was we were in the Detroit airport and uh, we're sitting there trying to get, our, get ready to get on a plane and these three guys in suits walk up and says, uh, Minister Farrakhan would like to speak with y'all. Okay, we're about to get killed in the airport because <laughs> he ain't liking what we're doing. And, and, and pretty much all he said was, you know, you guys are, you know, inspirations to, what, you know, to, the, to the black man and keep doing what you're doing. So, but it was scary. For that one minute, we're following, like, okay, uh, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? But that was, that, was a cool, that was a cool moment. But there was never any moment where I actually feared for my life in the WWF, WWE. Like, we were very, you know, at that point, you're so sterilized from the audience. You walk out, you walk back to the locker room, you get in the car and drive away. With that being said, like, you know, the heat came across on TV. And, and you guys are, are building and, and the fans are reacting. Mm -hmm. When this happens and knowing what the group stands for, how did it rub the boys in the back? Because everyone wants that reaction, right? Everyone wants to get over. You guys are getting over with a gimmick that isn't necessarily seen all the time in pro wrestling. How did it rub everyone else? Um, it rubbed them the right way because their wallets got fatter. <laughs> and that was the only thing is if you get over and then – Someone gets in the room with you by default. Both both people are over. Everyone's over. So as we were growing, you know, getting bigger and bigger and bigger and getting some steam, you know, so was DX. So was the Heart Foundation. So so was the Bariqua. So was you know the you know the um, uh, chains and skull. The uh, what are they called? The disciples of apocalypse. The, the, yeah, the DOA. Mm -hmm. So when we go out there, and, and it didn't matter whoever they put a combination of us out there in the ring with, when you're getting those reactions and the, the buildings are filling up, and meanwhile you got Stone Cold on top and you got Triple H on top drawing money in, everyone's happy. You know, and, 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 and as far as the boys, they're just happy to see, you know, Ron being in a nice spot, you know, getting his just due. Before I ask this next question, did you ever see the uh, the video? It's turned into a meme of the one white kid in the crowd that throws his fist up. He's got the glasses on. Yes, <laughs> yes. Everyone keeps saying that's like CM Punk or whatever. I believe that was Chicago. It's one white kid with glasses. Yep. You know what? I wish I get to meet that kid. <laughs> <laughs> so, in '97, in August '97, Rocky Maivia joins the group. Yeah. Before we get to The Rock and him being involved, when Ahmed Johnson got hurt, if he never was injured, do you think The Rock would have ended up in the Nation of Domination? You know, that's a good call. Uh, that's, you, you know, you never know. I mean, because I know Rocky got, was just coming off injury. And he had just, you know, not had a successful run as a singles. And this was his way of kind of growing in the, in the safe confines of a team structure. But that's a very good question. If Ahmed had never got hurt, would Rocky be given an opportunity? I, you know, that's, that's a tough one. That's a good hypothetical. I don't, I don't know how to answer that one. You and I'll follow, I'll follow with I this. Use, I usually can answer any question. You got me on that one. <laughs> I'll follow with this. Why didn't Ahmed necessarily fit with the group? I've heard a lot of things about him backstage, but for you, why didn't this feel right as a fit? I will say this. My mama always taught me if you got nothing good to say about somebody, say nothing. 
<laughs> that speaks, <laughs> speaks speaks volumes. A, yes, a thousand words right there. Okay, so why did Rocky fit? Why was that the way to go? Because listen, man, I, I saw the Jerry curl, I saw the outfit. <laughs> I, I I'm not looking at that guy and say, you know what? He's nation of domination. I think it was a good way to show this dark side of this clean cut kid who came out there smiling with the Jerry curl, you know, the colorful tights. Now let's show the darker side of him. Put him all in black. Let's see what he can do now. Put him with these other, other, other bad dudes. And then people got pissed off at him because they're like, well, we did kind of like you. We hated you a lot, but you're a good looking dude. We're supposed to like you, but now we really hate you. And so it just, it was just perfect, like lightning in a bottle. It just worked out. And then that allowed him to expand his charisma and get more comfortable out there. And, and hell, you, you know, he's still rolling as, as high as the sky will allow. So um, it was just a good fit. Um, we embraced Rocky coming in. Uh, and, and, and there was never any animosity in the group. It was all, you know, five of us out there just going out and having fun. So as the nation is getting bigger and bigger and Mark Henry's in the group, you got Kamal Mustafa who ends up being the godfather, Ron Simmons yourself, you have to separate yourself from the bunch as an individual talent. Mm -hmm. The head shake, we've heard the story before, I'm going to ask you to tell it again, uh -huh. the, but the chest plate. But in this, because we don't, in, in pro wrestling, we don't necessarily see a lot of versions of black. There's mm -hmm. certain things that fit black as like the superhero, but you guys, Rock was a great talker. Mm -hmm. Root felt like, you know, the, the big, strong presence. Mark Henry was the muscle guy. Mm -hmm. And then you had Kamu Mustafa, who was just, he felt like a mixed martial artist at the time. Yeah. Where did you feel like you fit in? How did you inject your blackness into the group? I just had to find my spot, because in all that, the nation had so much diversity, but I had to find who I was. And like you said, we had, we had the strong leader. You know, we had the good-looking guy. We had the muscle. We had the guy you don't want to see in a bar. Who am I? And that's when I started with the, just the cockiness and the head shake and the strut. And I was the guy who pissed people off and then ran behind the big guys and let them do the fighting. <laughs> so that became my role is I was the antagonist. And that's how I started embracing who I was and becoming comfortable who I was. Because look, when you got four dudes behind you and I'm not small, I'm 6'3", when they make me look small, these are good guys to have behind you. So that was that. Just became my role, just piss people off as much as I could. And, and go ahead, tell me the story about the head shake. Because some people do not know this story. So the head shake comes from back when we first started traveling. DVDs, portable DVDs, just became the thing. Okay, yeah, I know we're old as hell. <laughs> so we would carry a couple movies with us. Friday was one of them. Okay, so. It's a Sunday. I don't know where we are. Rocky and I are sitting in the room. We're watching Friday. You know, Debo bops a dude. Chris Tucker walks up and goes, you just got knocked up. You know, and I'm like, huh. So, spin forward the next night on Raw. Rocky's wrestling Ken Shamrock. We're getting ready to go live. You know, boom, match is going, boom, boom. Rocky knocks Ken over the top rope, and I run up sliding Ken's face. Cameras right here, I go, you just got knocked up, bleep out. And I'm shaking my head. And then the first thought was, oh, my God, I just cussed on national TV with the camera in front of me. Oh, God, Vince is going to find me. So for, we go all through commercial for us to match. I'm like, I'm going to explain to my fiance where that money went. I'm going to explain how I got fine. Match ends. So you walk up to the – you got to be bad walking up the ramp, turn back, boom. And he walk through the curtain. You go, you look around. And there's, there's two ways Vince can look at you. It's either – I'll put my glasses on. It's either this – or if he goes, you don't want that second one. So I come, I come through the curtain, and I get the glasses down. I get the finger. I'm going, oh, God, I'm going to get fined. I'm going to get fined. Walk over. Yeah, yes, sir. Hello, that uh, thing. Dude, your head. I don't like that. Keep doing that. That's it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Lee, I didn't get fine. I didn't get fine. And then I realized that that little thing connected to him. And if it connects to him, he's seen a billion and a half 
things. If it connected to him, then there might be something there. So the next week, turn the volume up, turn the volume up to where it looked like my head was going to fall off my body at some points. But lo and behold, it separated me from not only just the guys in the nation, but the rest of the roster. And that allowed me to strike out and have a personality, not just take a bump D'Lo or the guy who was, who was pissing people off. But now it was, there's a guy with, with there's depth to his character. Why does he walk like that? What, why do you think he's so cool? You know, I got to say, I was swag before there was swag. I'm going to put that out there. Um, but, you know, it, it was just allowing depth of character to become created. You talked about Cornette and him letting you and the gangsters kind of grow, right? Yeah. And yeah. he allowed you guys to do that. With Vince McMahon, how was that relationship with the Nation of Domination as you guys grew? How was Vince, in terms of you guys get through the curtain, how was his input on this faction? Vince just let us be us. It, it was Ron's discretion what we were going to do out there. You know, we had the confines of, of what they wanted us to do. Once we got out in the curtain, just just go out there and make people mad. And then, then it, you know, we got directions when it was like, okay, now we're going to work with the Heart Foundation. Now we're going to work with DX. D'Lo, you're going to spin off with X-Pac. You know, Rocky, you're going to spin off with Triple H. You know, Kama and Godfather, you and the Road Dog and, 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 and Billy Gunn are going to spin off. So that's where the, the input came. But as far as in-ring stuff, just go have fun. Mm. Just go have fun. So and that, was, ask, that was the cool part about Attitude. We were all out there just – that's what connected with people. If you look it up and down the roster, we were all just out there just – it wasn't – we weren't robots. We were all just freelancing out there having a good time. So let me ask you, because you always talk about the boys backstage, and I've heard stories from other wrestlers, you know, that, you know, politics are different backstage, you know, mm -hmm. your views on sexuality are different backstage. Mm -hmm. How did you get along with everybody backstage? And have you ever had, you know, somebody who didn't want to necessarily do business with you because of what you, who you were and what you represented? You know, I consider myself Switzerland. I get along with everybody, and I try that on purpose. I may not agree with who you are or what you want to be or how you – having yourself in real life. And we may not go out and have Sunday dinner together. But when it goes to being in the ring, we're going to do business. Now, if, it, if you don't like me as a person, that's cool. If you don't like me because you don't want to do business with me, that goes to a different level. Now it's you're, 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 you're messing with my, mo my money, my mo and my business. And that's when your problems are too big. Now, there always are, there always are guys who, oh, D'Lo's not on my level. I don't want to put him over. Or, you know, what do I gain working for D'Lo at D'Lo at the time? Hey, that's going to happen. At the end of the day, Vince is telling you to go out there and wrestle me. Let's go wrestle. And then allow me to go make you look good so you can go make money too. And that's how I always, I always looked at it. It's like, you don't go out there and look good. I don't care. I'm going to look good. I'm going to go do what I got to do. I mean – Again, you took a million bumps, so you made everyone look good. But <laughs> that was my. But I'm, I'm gonna make you look good. Allow me to make you look good. <laughs> um, carrying on with the nation, we we see the nation kind of, you know, go through a little bit of changes. But a change that sticks out is Owen Hart. Yeah. Joining the nation of domination. So you touched on that DX feud. I think he joined right before mm -hmm. that feud. Talk about. You know, one Owen coming into the group and just Owen Hart himself as a wrestler. Okay, well, Owen coming in, we were getting a ton of heat. And what would make white people more mad is one of them joined a bunch of black people. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the point was to make get even more heat on us. And, and we always went around it. You know, uh, Owen wasn't a black sympathizer. He was the black heart. So he could fit right in because he was mad at everybody else. Um, and that got tremendous reaction that him being out there with us was amazing. Now, as a person, um, there are very few people that I enjoyed spending every second I could around in my life. And, and Owen was one of those people where it was like, man, just, I, I adored everything he taught me. He took the time to, to help me in the ring as a person. Hell, he, she showed me how to change flights on airlines. You know, like just 
awesome things. And, and, and I got to be around one of the most genuine people I've ever met in my life. Hmm. Who presented the idea of Owen joining? How did that even come up? Well, that was a Vince thing. That was a Vince thing. Hey, what do you think about the block cart? Join in the nation. We love it, Vince. Let's do it. <laughs> we love it. So shortly after this, you get involved with the DX View, which is much talked about. The, uh, the segment that happens that everybody remembers is DX emulating everybody. Xbox comes out in blackface. I mean, obviously, different time. Some people right. just don't understand the timing of this. Were you aware of what was going to happen before, before DX came out and did that segment? Yeah, we actually helped them with the mannerisms of who we were. Like, I sat with Road Dog and, and showed him how to be me, and then he showed me he was better me than me. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, we were there. We were, we were there in the context of what was going on. Um, we, knew, we knew an outline of what they were going to do out there. Um, and, and I had no issue with it. I mean, in hindsight, you can't do, you can't do some of those things that we, they did, we did back then, like the blackface, just not, not cool in retrospect. Um, but it, it, I had no problems with it as it was happening. How much of that is just the product of the Attitude Era? And that was, you know, of you guys just constantly pushing the needle. And, and that's exactly what it was. It was Attitude and us, us trying to find that next level of what can we hit now that's, that's going to help us expand? What can we do now that'll put us on a more national spotlight? And it was just just push the envelope and see where we can go, see what we can get away with before they slap us on the wrist and tell us to come back. And that was attitude in general. Are you aware? I mean, I don't think you, I don't know if you were back then, but did you aware, were you aware of the impact that you were having on African American pro wrestling fans who, like myself, I didn't understand why the nation was getting booed. I was a black dude who was like, hell yeah, beat that ass. Like I was that guy. So did, were you aware of the impact that you were having on African American fans? Um, in many ways, yes, because I knew the impact that Ron had on me and in showing me that there was someone who looked like me who could actually be good in wrestling. And when you had a group of five guys who were all black and were out there winning and winning championships and beating people up and laying people out, you know, you know in your head there's some kid who's nine years old who's sitting on TV, just like, like sitting on a bed watching a TV, just like I was watching, going, he looks like me. And you knew, you knew. And, and, and that's, that's something you have to uh, embrace and hold on to. And that's um, not that I ever say I'm a role model, but I just, um, I know what it means to see someone like yourself doing things that you didn't think anyone who looked like us could do. And so, yeah, we embraced it. We, we, we talked about it a few times and, and, and there were things we would not do because we didn't want it to affect kids of color in different ways. So, and there were things we did, we we're like, oh yeah, we, they're gonna love this. You know, so it, we, we, we knew what we were, I mean, nothing, you know, we didn't know the enormity of the impact. We just knew there'd be some kid somewhere wanting to be like us. So that was, that was cool. The, I'm not sure if you hear this as much, but I mean, being on social media and we'll get to the Kofi Kingston winning the championship stuff a little later, but how do you feel? Cause it is something that is said when they, people say the rock wasn't a black champion mm -hmm. when they don't look at Rocky as a black champion and look at him as something different. I hear the term racially ambiguous a lot. People do not consider him a black champion. You were around Ron, the black champion. Yeah. Rocky was like, next, black champion. Mm -hmm. Why do people look at them differently? You spent time around both. You know, I just think it's society and their way of trying to social acceptance and whatever made them feel good about what they were seeing. Because maybe they didn't want to, maybe they didn't want to cheer a, a black guy at that time. I don't know. Um, all I can say is Rocky's a black champion. He's one of six now. When you include um, when you include uh, Rich Swan, and I want to come a day when 
it's not a shock when a man of color wins a world title. It's just a normal day occurrence. And when that day comes, I will be happy as hell. Yeah, me too. Before we embark on your solo career, I want to ask you this. If the Nation of Domination were here in 2020, considering mm-hmm. everything that's going on in the world, is there any way in hell that it could have been a heel faction in 2020? No. No way, no way, no way, no. Uh, no, we could no. We no, we couldn't even exist it in today's culture. I don't mm-hmm. think it would I don't think it would have worked. I don't think it I don't think you're playing on, as we talked about earlier, you're playing on not only our stereotype, but the fan stereotype as well. And that dynamic just doesn't exist anymore. That just mm-hmm. it's not there anymore. And and thankfully it's not. You know, right. now we're we're moving past that. We've moved past that. So I just don't think in today's world that would that would work in any shape or form, way, shape or form. So let's let's talk about the solo career. Nation domination splits, everybody does their own thing. Hold on, hold on. While you're getting ask your question, I'm gonna turn this light on because I'm getting too dark. All right. <laughs> so you embark on your solo career. Uh, obviously you had some success holding the IC and European titles. Was there a time when you knew the nation was splitting that you were concerned? about where your solo career was headed because you came into the WWF as part of the nation, whereas everybody else, with the exception of Mark Henry, had some time being a solo act. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I had always been in the confines of this group, and I had never really done anything by myself. So, yeah, you know, when you're, when you're part of a team, and all of a sudden they split the team off, and now you're out there by yourself in the ring, that's a hard transition. I've always had someone to tag to, you know, I've, I've always had someone to pick me up. I've always had that, that elder statesman in my ear going, do this now, try this. And now for the first time I had to go out there by myself on the biggest stage in the world and, and, and not fall on my face. So yeah, you, you worry about that for a minute, but then you turn that, that worry into, into positive energy and you try to turn it into a fuel and then you go, uh-uh, I'm not going to let myself down. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be better. This is going to be a better version of me than that was. And that's just that's the evolution of who you got to be. You just got to keep going and going and going. So once I, once I embrace being out there by myself, yeah, just let me run. Just let me run. What was your favorite solo feud? So <laughs> Xbox European title. No ifs, ands, or buts. Um, just in wrestling, sometimes guys have chemistry. Um, you can't explain it. Just guys click. I think Xbox and I could have had a hell of a match inside of a phone booth. You know, I think we were just we just clicked. And anytime we went out there, we just highlighted the best of what each of us could do. And, I mean, case in point, we took a European title that no one cared about and made it feel like a world title. You know, so because we cared about it and we put we put level of matches to it. We didn't go have crap matches. We put main event matches. We might have been opening match. We were going to give a main event match. And then, yeah, just X-Pac, without a doubt. I got to ask this about X-Pac because when we talk about great pro wrestlers and everybody talks about the click back then, the DX, I don't think they talk about him enough in terms of his work in the ring because he was an exceptional performer. Yes, he was, and he doesn't get his due. I mean, but you know, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say um, he was overshadowed. But you got, you got, you know, four Hall of Famers out there, and an X was the glue that held them all together. And he never got credit for being that glue. He was just always there. Um, but he could. I mean, there are very few guys who could who could wrestle the way he can to move around the ring with whoever you know he can be in the ring with guys who are a foot taller and a hundred pounds heavier and still make it look good and competitive. Very few guys out there could do that. And he did it every night, like without effort, without effort. So he does not get the, the credit he deserves sometimes, I think. Real is quick. that, wait, wait, hold on, Ken, because okay. I gotta ask this question. This is the reason why I asked this. You call x Pox the glue, mm-hmm. right? Was, was the reason why you guys had such great chemistry because you guys were both the glue of your respective groups. Mm. And both of you guys, I think over time, people have respected your work much later. But back then, it felt like you both, in a way, were a little bit overlooked and had something to prove. And when you feuded for that European title, 
I think it woke everybody up. I feel like you guys were two peas in the pot in that man. Would you agree? Um, yeah, I, I would say that we were, uh, in wrestling wise, we we're twin brothers from different mothers because we both had something to prove while we're out there. We, you know, m- you know, we had something to prove and you're right. We were the, we were always the fifth wheel in our group. And when given the opportunity to go out there and become front and center, we weren't going to let it go. So yeah, I would agree with that. Kind of following in that same regard, there's always these discussions that go, who was before their time? Cause it was a land of giants and you got, you're not small. Mm-hmm. But like you said, there was four guys behind you that were a lot bigger. Mm-hmm. You have these wrestlers where people say, if those guys wrestled today in the, in the culture that is pro wrestling today, those guys would be stars. You and I feel like X-Pac are two of those guys. Do you mm-hmm. think you guys were before your time? You know, I think, I think a lot of guys from the history can say, I was born 10 years too late or 10 years too early. Um, I am totally happy for the, the era I was born in, but I look at the landscape of wrestling right now, and I know me at 30 right now, God, I have so much fun. I have so much fun right now. Like, I, there's such quality of talent out there right now and, and the high level of work. And I know I could, my, me at 30 could fit right in there and just, just flow. So it, it, would, it would be fun. If you ever invent a time machine, let me know. Um, and and we'll, we'll, we'll do some business, all right? <laughs> <laughs> Got you, D-Lo. All right, so July 2000, it seems like your career is like, trying to figure out where you're going to fit in. Mm-hmm. And then you end up in this group, which has for the headbangers, Tiger Ali Singh, yep. the lowdown, and you're wearing seek attire. Yeah. Uh, you say, there was an interview, I got to read this, because you said, when I had to put on the Aladdin pants and the turban and pretend I wasn't black anymore, I was seek. That was a low point in my career. When something is presented to you and you yep. want to get back on TV, you're willing to compromise yourself. In retrospect, I wish I'd never agreed to it. Yeah. What the hell was this? How was it presented to you? And even now, do you re- regret agreeing to do it? Um, I, yes and no. I had regrets. First of all, I had no regret because I, didn't, I was with Chaz, and he and I have been friends. We've known each other since high school. Okay, our, our high schools wrestle each other in high school. So I've known of Chaz since I was in high school. And, you know, our ex-wives used to be best friends. So it was great being out there with my boy. And we were low down with the track pants on and no top. I love that. Um, then it was presented to bring Tiger Ali in as our manager because they wanted to get him back on TV and give him a, a vehicle to get back on TV. And it, and, and, and it was, you know, was presented to us as, you know, we're really going to put steam on you guys because we want to get Tiger over because we need the Indian following and we're going we're gonna to really steam you up. Okay. All right. And then the attire ideas were presented. And, you know, I'm, I keep saying to myself, I'm going to look like damn Aladdin. I'm going to look like Aladdin. No, I'm going to look like Genie, not Aladdin. I'm going to look like Genie. You know, so I was like, this is, this is rotten. But, you know, you, you convince yourself, you know, we're not being used right now. Let's get back on TV. Let's just get over and we can transition to something else. And, and, you know, to me, that was just, in retrospect now, I don't think I would have done it. I think I would have just said, you know, I'll, let's take a hard pass on that. But at the time, you want to go out there and just, you know, you always want to be in the ring competing. It's the only place you can show what your worth is in the ring competing. And you can't do anything sitting in a locker room. And I just wanted to be out there competing. And, you know, I... I I took a step back from who I was as a, as a person and performer to sacrifice being out there in the ring, and I, I wouldn't do it again. Um, no, I, I wouldn't do it again. Me now, at this age, with the way I think, no. No, 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 no. How do you pull yourself back from that? How do you regain the confidence that is lost from that era? Because um, you had plenty to give after that. How did you pull yourself up? You just know you're better than that. You're better than a bad gimmick. Um, just because someone puts a bad gimmick on you doesn't define you as a worker or as a person. Just defines you as a guy who had a bad gimmick on him. And, and you move from that. You go, when I become me again, 
watch out. I'll never not be me again. And from that time, I, I, I was asked one time to change who I was. And I told her, I said, no. And either, either you're booking D'Lo Brown me or you're not booking me at all. And that was the choice I made from that point. I was like, either I'm going to be me or that's it. You don't have to say who, who told you that, but what was the gimmick that they try to strap on you? They wanted to make me some Morpheus gimmick where I was going to look like Lawrence Fishburne <laughs> from Matrix, wearing the, you know, the long trench coat and the, the you know, updated sci-fi kind of clothing. No, I'll pass. Yeah. I'll pass. <laughs> Good choice. I'll pass. Yes. I-, I need to ask you this question because back then, in, I think in the early 2000s, was there, was there a, a heavy influence of, like, writers in the room back then? Or were you guys able to cut promos on your own? No, the talent were the writers. I mean, we, we did all that. Like, you know, I remember there were times when people would ask, well, you, can, you know, they'd ask Ron, what are you going to say out there? And he goes, I don't know. I'm just going to say something. Okay. <laughs> and then he'd go out there and he'd spit these lyrics. And you'd be like, whoa. You know, so – they just let us be us. And I think that was the beautiful thing of like, that's how Rocky grew. He got to make mistakes out there and find out what worked and what didn't work. That's how Mark Henry grew. He got to make mistakes out there and find out what worked and what didn't work. You just didn't have this script. And if it didn't work, you couldn't. It's, it's, imagine a quarterback in the NFL who can't audible. Run the play. Run this play. Wait, no, the D-line is looking at me and they're pointing. We're going to be right here. Run the play. Like, I'm going to get killed if I run this play. Run the play. We didn't have that. We had the ability to audible. The reason I ask this is, like, as you watch now, it's, it's a lot more scripted, right? And I hear stories of the writers' rooms being mostly white people, but you have black and you have Latino talent. Can you tell when somebody's writing for somebody that doesn't really know what that person would say and how to say it? Oh, yeah, because if you, you can tell when someone doesn't believe the words coming out of their mouth. And you can tell when it's written by someone who has no clue the shoes and the steps they've taken in their lives to get to this point. And you can tell. That's why the beautiful thing I think in us and Impact is we let our talent just, here's an outline. Hit these bullet points, now go talk. Go be you. We'll come back and we'll tweak the promo and we'll go for next time. But go be you. So, yeah, you can, you can see when something's disingenuous. You can see when str- someone is struggling with the words and they're like, you know, and it just, they don't, you don't feel it. But you can tell when someone, when, when it's the other way and someone believes and they connect with it, that's when you're like, those words are like lyrics. Those words, it's like, it's like, it's like Shakespeare. It's like, damn, this brother really means he's going to kick, kick somebody's ass. Like that's when you know it's, it's like from the heart. You can, it's like Ray Charles could see it. Literally, Ray Charles could see it. No, I'm glad you guys do that at Impact. Uh, Wrestling with Stereotypes alum, Chris Bay, has been crushing it. And I feel it every time he goes out there. That's my boy. (laughs) No, man, that guy, that guy's the future. Like, we we saw him two years ago. We had him on Wrestling with Stereotypes, our first live show. And Mm -hmm. when he walks in the room, it's just a different energy. Just his aura is different. He just, he's one of those guys... He has, he's confident in himself and he's confident in his own skin. So when he goes out there, you believe what he's doing because he exudes that confidence and not in a negative way or in a heel way, just as a person, he believes in his skill so much that he's never going to have a bad match. He's never going to have a bad interview. He's never, you know, he, he knows that. And that comes off every time he goes to the ring, comes off every time he talks. You know, he, when he walks his, his ring entrance, when he's got that swag walking there, like, dude has got it. And, yeah, he, he's going to be the future. Trust me. There, there are big things popping for him. So coming back to towards the end of your WWE career, in the end of 2002, you and Teddy Long are joining forces, thugging mm-hmm. and bugging. Yep. Where the interesting thing was, it kind of felt like a semi-rehash of the Nation of Domination and a semi-hybrid like hybrid of the gangsters where you – kind of complain about racism and, you know, being held down by the man. Um, whose idea was this? And at that time when it was brought up to you, were you kind of burnt out on the idea of, like, I kind of already do this shit? 
it, it, you know what? It, it was brought up. It was another one. It was Vince to get back on TV, and he's like, "Well, let's let's put you and Tay Long together, and let's uh, let's make you more aggressive and 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 more anti society." And within a second, I'm like, "This is the third incarnation of this in my career." I mean, I've played this character twice before, so when we tried it, I think society already started to move away from it. So it never got wheels. I don't think I was totally into it because I was just being who I was before. So I didn't evolve, I devolved. So people are just looking at me going, you went from your continental champion back to this. Hmm. So I devolved as a, as a performer, society had moved on and it just, it just did, did not work. It did not work at all. Tell us a little bit about Teddy Long though. Cause yeah. Teddy has been outspoken with, you know, just, the fair treatment of black wrestlers and athletes yeah. and how he's very vocal. What was it like just working with Teddy Long? By the way, the people you've worked with is incredible. Just I'm side by side with like, I'm blessed. Oh, who's who of all of famers. And no wonder you're just such an amazing voice in pro wrestling. But what was it like working with Teddy Long? Teddy is a good brother. Um, he's one of those dudes who sit down and talk to you like, like that uncle that'll really, he'll put it on you. Like, you know, you got people in your family who tell you what they want to hear. And then he's the kind of guy who tell you what you need to hear, you know? And he'll sit down and he's real, he's real as real can be. And when he's your boy, he will run through a brick wall for you. And there's no – he will do anything for you. And I, I love Teddy. <laughs> Teddy is right there. Ron, Teddy. They're, they're right there on my on my on list of mentors, my, my Mount Rushmore mentors and, and – uh, even doing this, and Teddy was like, man, this ain't no, you know, even we knew what was going on, Teddy was always like, just go out there and kill it. Just go out there and kill it. And I, 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 I don't have enough good things to say about Teddy Long. Before we move on to you departing WWE and, and, and you're going to TNA for respell and everything else, I just want to circle back to the, the last thing about WWE is um, a lot of things have been said about Vince McMahon over the years in, mm -hmm. in terms of sensitivity to racial issues, some of the gimmicks that have been used in the past. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people have talked about Triple H going over on Booker T at that WrestleMania and how that angle was played. But your experience, how would you describe Vince and how he sees race, gender, and sexuality in pro wrestling? Well, Vince um, – is is just nothing but business he always is he always will be um he's he's whatever he thinks is good for his bottom line uh i've never had an issue with vince and you know i've seen a lot of, I've, I've heard or seen a lot of things but none of that has ever been directed at me um now vince part of vince thinks he's black um <laughs> part of vince thinks he's the coolest thing in the world um, but you know, uh, the one thing I do know about Vince is he's an evil genius and, and he's straight up business and he wouldn't ask you to do anything he's not willing to do himself. Case in point, falling off a cage or scaffolding or at 55 years old going to main event WrestleMania. So there's nothing he wouldn't do. Hell, even tearing both quads is still going on with the, with the damn promo. So there's nothing he wouldn't do that he wouldn't be willing to ask someone else to himself. Um, and he's always going to try to do what's best for you and for, in terms of what is good for business. Is there a point in pro wrestling, again, before we continue, is mm -hmm. there a point in pro wrestling where there's like that line where you say the, the game has passed me by as, as a mind. Cause we talk about Vince, we talk about Cornette, we talk about, you know, these people who've been, in the business, the business of pro wrestling mm -hmm. for decades. And people say they don't got it anymore. People tell them to walk away now because you, you see guys and you've seen so much pro wrestling. You're in a position at impact where mm -hmm. you're able to pass that down. What if in 20 years, someone says you got to walk away. Is there a shelf life on the minds of pro wrestling? Um, look, I think the fundamentals of wrestling are always going to be the same. I think wrestling and society have to evolve. And I think maybe that's where you're kind of like, kind of insinuating that maybe they've lost track of society and, and lost track that it's 2020, not 1990. 
or not 2000. Um, and in 20 years, if someone goes, hey, Gila, man, that idea is old and it's been done a thousand times. And if I ain't got nothing better, I'm going to look at him and go, you're right. I'm going home and I'm going fishing. <laughs> <laughs> I think you'll be around. You're fine. <laughs> look, look, my back can't last forever, but my brain, I got, I'm good with that one right now. Mm. So you leave the WWE and you spend some time in uh, TNA, part of the Aces and Eights, briefly. Yep. Uh, you go to all Japan for a little while, uh, oh, yeah. you pro wrestling syndicate. Um, in, in these different ventures, these different areas, did you notice where any places where minorities were treated different, allowed more room to breathe as a character? Or, I mean, what did you see in these experiences, especially in all Japan being a black man? Well, in Japan was different because when you're an established character who's over, who they're bringing an act in, no one's going to treat you differently. You know, it's, you're out there just going, here, you're in the main event at Corrigan Hall. You're in the main event at Sumo Hall. You go, 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 go. Um, sponsored dinners, no problems, nothing like that. And I, I love Japan. love Japan to the bottom of my heart. Um, and I think I got lucky in terms of when I went out into the world again, I was that name character. So when guys bring you in, they're not going to treat you disrespectfully. They're – they're gonna, you're, you you earn a reputation where they're gonna they're gonna just treat you with the respect that you've earned or more than you're you know you've earned, but they're gonna give you that respect. So I was never ever, luckily, knock on wood, um, around anything like that after my you know WV run. Nothing like that. Now once again I've heard stories, but I've never I never got to experience it. In your time in TNA, like. Was it a culture shock? Did you go in and say, man, this is, this is different. This isn't where I came from. Because, I mean, I like Aces and A's. Everyone does, I think. Uh, there's a fondness in everyone's heart for that. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it was brief, like not as long as it should have been. Right. And um, it's different than WWE. It just was. The culture was different. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, it was a different place. And, yeah, it was a culture shock. And you have to adjust to where you are. You know, it's, I, you know, you're like, did I arrive in a limo and now I'm leaving my Uber? You know, it's kind of like that feel. But you have to make the best of your situation. And, and, and I tell people now, it's like, you know, it doesn't matter where you are or where you came from. All that matters is today we're on the same show in the same building and it doesn't matter. Now let's just go out there and perform. Because I don't care if you're in a building of 30,000 people or 300 people or three people. When you get inside that ring, it's the exact same intensity it has to be anywhere else. So the only thing you notice is the walk to the ring. That's different. In the ring, you got to go perform like, you know, you got to go perform. And that's just what you do. You're, you know, it may not be the, the locker room or the building I'm used to walking in. But, you know, you're building your reputation as a, as a talent, as a worker, and your work rate can't go down just because, you know, you're not in the place you grew up in. So now you're at this, this position of impact, and um, Rich Swan has just become the second person, to hold, like African American, to hold that belt. Mm -hmm. And he credits you for coming back to pro wrestling. And before I really dig into that story a little bit, once you become the elder statesman of pro wrestling and you become this African American that a lot of us look up to, um, do you recognize and understand the responsibility that you have uh, because Rich Swan needed somebody like you. And so, and, you know, some of these wrestlers look for somebody like you to be the bright spot in their life to come back to this business because they may have been treated bad with all these stories. So when did you understand and acknowledge, like, I kind of have a responsibility to these young black wrestlers to, uh, you know, give them these opportunities? Um, it, 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 yeah, I grew an understanding of it as I was coming around the last part of me traveling around wrestling and just seeing how I was treated in the locker room um, with reverence and respect. And when I would talk, um, I found myself not talking, but holding court. And, and when you get to that same way, and, and ironically, I'm sitting there going, this is what Ron used to do. So when you find yourself, you know, in that juxtaposition of going from the young kid to now sounding exactly like Ron Simmons talking to these kids, and watching them and, and then saying something to them and watching them go out there and do it in the ring and come back and then look for your approval. Did you watch it? You, you know, 
there's a there's a different kind of there's a different position I'm in now, uh, and and I'm one of not just a senior referee, but there or a senior wrestler, but there's one of, of a position of influence and power, and you know I may I think if I use this the right way, it can help this business out, and it can help more men of color in this business succeed. So, um, you know that came around slowly. But it was easy. To, it was easy to kind of see, uh, and then you gotta you gotta embrace it and and run with it and and be careful because um, you don't want to abuse that power. Looking at now that we're on, you know, the topic of impact, you guys are so diverse over there. I mean, you have Swan, you have Moose, uh, you have Chris going down there. Uh, the women's division super diverse. Sue Young right now, like so much diversity do you take pride in being part of that change in pro wrestling where this wasn't the case 10 years ago maybe five years ago dude hell yeah i love looking at our locker room and 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 looking around and seeing every walk of life in there you know black white female lgbtq it doesn't matter all that matters they go out there and perform in that ring and, 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 and just be great talents and be, be, be good people. And I don't care. And I love seeing that. I don't care about anything else. And it's amazing to, to oversee that. Like, it's giddy. It's different than the locker room um, I grew up in. But I'm glad it's the locker room they get to grow. Mm, strong statement. Uh, I have to ask you, because we got to bring some levity to this. So... Mark Henry on Table of Three told a story about a tag match with the Outlaws in Chicago involving you. Mm -hmm. We did a springboard leg drop on Road Dog, and uh -huh. something happened. Man, I don't remember. And Mark, we sat there and I argued with him. I'm like, Mark, I don't remember this. Now, if it happened, it happened. But I don't remember it. But once again, when you've had like 5,000 matches in your career, you don't remember everything all the time anyway. But I think I remember pooing in the ring. <laughs> <laughs> to follow that, what is your favorite on the road story with those guys? Or just in general, is there a favorite story that you had? Because um, we've heard the story about the, how the people's elbow came together. We've heard stories about you guys on the road. What's your favorite moment on the road that maybe a lot of people don't know about? It was just in general being on the road with those guys. What people don't understand was we just did, we didn't just roll in the ring together and play around. We would travel together. We'd all sleep in a hotel room together. I can't tell you ten times Rocky and I shared a room, or Mark and I shared a room, or Godfather or or Ron and I shared a room. So it was the camaraderie in the cars, a three hundred mile drive from building to building, um, going from town to town, talking, just becoming friends and bonding. Like that, to me, there's nothing greater than that. Like that's the most enjoyable part of my career was those, those times riding in the car with those guys. And there were times when, you know, we'd get a van and all five of us be in a car just, just cutting it up for, for five hours, six hours and not caring. And, and that's the important part. That's the part that, that made me happy. My last question is, I want to pick your wrestling brain real quick. Who's the hidden gem in pro wrestling, whether it's Impact or outside of the company? Who's that D'Lo Brown that where you look at now and be like, you know what? People sleep on that person, but they're about to go off when they get the chance. See, up until about a month ago, I would have said it was, Chris, I would have said it was uh, Rich Swan because he's the hidden gem. Um, but, you know, I look at guys like Ace Austin, who mm -hmm. I think that kid has potential. Um, you know, Trey Miguel, I think, my goodness, the, the sky is the limit for him, you know? Um, and hell, there's so much quality talent and impact. Be, I'd be remiss to just name even more because, hell, I'm going to forget somebody. Um, <laughs> the cool part about being me is I get to watch the entire roster and see who gets to – see who start, gets that little fire under him, see who mm -hmm. starts to grow. And then you, get, then you sit back and go, all right, let's, let's see what he can do. Oh, all right, I'm, I'm watching. I got you. I got you. And you see them connect on that level where now you're, you're crossing over. And that's when I go have that talk with them. I go, all right, you're done wrestling now. Let's go be an entertainer. Let's connect on another level. Mm -hmm. 
let's let's think of psychology on a different level now and connect that way and let's take it to a nut let's turn it up another notch that's the fun part for me is it hard to do that without fans it's it's hard right now um because we actors are always into you know instant gratification i do something fans react i do something there's a yay there's a boo now we feel like more in with, with COVID, obviously, what's going on, but now it feels more like a movie, where now they go out there and do something, and they've got to wait for the reviews to come back to see how it worked. It, it's like being in a movie now. So now it's just the adjustment. You've got to – you just adjust to the situation and, and try to work the best. I mean, I, I tell you, it makes you think differently because always – you know, you always say, let's do this in the ring, this in the ring, this ring, and I guarantee people will react this way. Well, you can't say that anymore because you don't know how they're going to react because you don't react until, you know, two weeks later when they see it on TV. Mm-hmm. So it makes you rethink how you agent and, and, and how you would work out there. And it, I give a lot of respect to those talent who are in the ring in this day and age with no fans to to – get that adrenaline from no fans to get that instant feedback from, but still going out there and putting on high level matches. Like the building was full of 10,000 people. Like they get mad props for me for that. So I got to ask you because it's 2020. We've talked so much about the nation of domination and I don't know if you got the sense of this, but you and those guys are one of the reasons why I've loved this business so much. And you, you gave us, you gave me so much pride as a young black kid you know, as a teenager who just looked up and was like, I was my militant black ass was love, soaking up every minute of it. When you look at groups now, like the Hurt Business, the New Day, you look and see Chris Bay and Rich Swan, and I've talked to all these guys. I've talked to Apollo Crews, Uga Nation. I've talked to Moose. Everybody talks about the impact that the Nation of Domination had on them. When you hear that, because there's no way in hell you could have possibly known in 1997 that we'd be looking 23 years later and the impact that you guys have had. How does this all make you feel? It makes me feel tremendous because we're gonna, we as a nation will leave the business a better place than we found it. And that's all you can ever ask for. Like literally I'm choked up right now. Like it's crazy. Like you don't, you don't know how, how deep that hits me. And, and to have, have young men help, Young wrestlers in general, doesn't even matter color or gender, come up to me and tell me that time you were in the nation or your head shake or, or my mama hated you, but I loved you. <laughs> yeah. Like, you, when you start on this journey, you can never, ever envision having that kind of connection. But it's pretty cool when you're on this side looking back going, damn, I did good. I did all right. It's better than good, bro. Yeah. <laughs> like, I did all right. Listen, a- as a group, you guys are impactful, but I'll let you know Hall of Fame, it, you guys individually are all in our Hall of Fame. As minorities, as wrestling fans growing up, I mean, I was eight years old watching Nation Domination. You are all Hall of Famers for me and the reason why we watch wrestling. And I can speak for everyone in our generation, older than me, younger than me. You guys are all Hall of Famers and change the business. Stop it. You're going to make me cry. Stop it, damn it. Stop it. Listen, Listen you got to get your flowers. You got you to take them. <laughs> then, then you're going you're gonna to get these flowers, bro, because you deserve it. Because, listen, when I, when I had the opportunity to have you on our first show, and I reached out to Ann Evans, shout out for Impact to Ann Evans, and I was like, I got to have you on. Because, like, like we just talked about, you meant the world to us. And I don't think a lot of people um, – especially for young African-Americans who, who we look for somebody to that looks like us and how much it means that we can do this too. And when you're trying to do it, I know a lot of times we live in our bubble and we go, I'm just trying to live. I'm just trying to eat. I'm just trying to make sure my family's fed. But when you step out of that bubble, you got to, I, I don't know if you really know how much of an impact that you have on us individually. So it's the reason why when Kofi Kingston wins the title, you know, you see MVP and Shad got rest of soul crying. It's the reason why when Kofi Mania happens, we, we were all going crazy. It's the reason why when we see Rich Swan being the champion, it still means so much to us. So we have to thank you, D-Lo, because it's, 
There's just no way. Like, this show right here probably wouldn't exist without the Nation of Domination. Put it. Our, our first show at Wrestling With Stereotypes, at the end, before everyone left, we took a picture. Everyone raised a fist, the Nation <laughs> of Domination fist. Awesome. In the picture. Everyone. And we have that picture. It was our first show for Wrestling With Stereotypes, our live show at StarCast. And that's the impact. We're not even wrestlers. We cover it as journalists. And you have impacted us. We have never stepped in the ring. And we paid homage when we can. So it's... I can tell you from all of us from the nation, I will say thank you. I will say thank you for allowing us to entertain and be part of your lives. And, and you know, when we inspire, I hope that we inspire you to inspire the next. And that's how the cycle goes. You know, we were inspired to do it. We handed it to you. Now it's your turn. And I said it to all young black men who, who watched us, all wrestlers who watched us and, and were motivated by what we do. Now it's your turn. Listen, we got it. I just got to learn the neck roll, but I got Girl, it. It's just, just, just go and don't worry about it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I will work on that. Now we... Our inaugural show, so it means so much. Thank you. Thanks to everyone watching and listening, wherever you may be listening. Thanks to adfreeshows.com. Check us out and every other show on there. Thanks to Conrad Thompson. It is great. Make sure you check out our future shows as well. Can't say enough. D'Lo Brown, the legend, joining us. I'm Kel Dansby, Andreas Hale. This is Wrestling with Stereotypes. Can't wait to see you guys next time. For now, we're out. Peace.